that allows me to pass on to the next paper. So, um, yep, <laughs> indeed. So the speaker is going to be Anatoly Segura from Banca d'Italia, and we are turning to the cross-border banking and the ring fencing. And uh, it's very nice to see that this is a paper that, not for you this time, you have exceeded that age, but uh, was sponsored by us for under the Lampalusi Fellowship Program for your young co-author, um, Ying Zhang. So that's very nice to see the success of this paper. Applause yours. 20 thank, minutes, please. Thank you. Thank you very much for, to the organizers for inviting us to present the paper. We are particularly delighted to present the paper in, in this institution, in this Euro Tower, as opposed to, <laughs> to the other big towers. And as for reasons that will become apparent uh, from the very first slide. So this is joint work with uh, Jing Zheng, who, by the way, is sitting, uh, is sitting uh, there physically. And also joint work with uh, John G. Lawrence, who is sitting virtually somewhere at the, at the WebEx uh, <laughs> platform. So uh, um, let me stress that the usual disclaimer applies. These are not necessarily the views of the Bank of Italy, nor the Euro system. So uh, let me motivate the paper. So uh, as, uh, as, you, as you know, cross-border banks frequently use uh, 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 an organizational structure that is uh, uh, operating through subsidiaries, and that gives them uh, a lot of flexibility when it comes to the allocating internal capital within the bank. The, that flexibility in particular means that they can let fail a subsidiary that is in, in, in distress, and they can also voluntarily decide to, to, to support it from, from the parent. Now, uh, national authorities don't like so much that, uh, that flexibility, and uh, sometimes they tend to limit those uh, cross-border capital flows, particularly during, during uh, crisis times, in order to defend what is called the uh, national interest. And people usually refer to those uh, actions by the authorities as ring fencing. Now, during the global financial crisis and also the European debt crisis, there were many, many episodes of bank distress, and there were uh, some examples uh, both of voluntary support and of uh, ring fencing. So this uh, generated uh, a vivid open, uh, and I think to some extent still open ring fencing debate. And basically, the, the, the overall idea is that ring fencing is somehow constrains the efficient capital allocation within a group and tends to, to lead to some suboptimal resolution of banking crisis. But at the same time, <clears throat> we've seen that uh, despite the this awareness uh, that uh, ring fencing can create problems, there is little progress in supervisory coordination to remove local ring fencing powers. And this applies even to, to the Euro Area Banking Union. As, uh, as is highlighted by the very frequent uh, speeches by Andrea Enria and uh, Elke Koenig, in which they, they, they kind of complain that uh, ring fencing is still an issue in the Euro Area Banking Union. So, given this, this motivation, what the, this theory paper uh, tries to answer is the, the following questions. So, we want to understand when, when does ring fencing arise? And, uh, and what uh, our answer, and something very important we are going to, to be emphasizing, and uh, it's not very surprising, but we think it has been somewhat uh, overlooked by the policy debate and also the literature, is that correlation between the assets of the cross-border bank units is, is very important. What we find is that for large correlation and under national authorities, there is going to be ring fencing when uh, uh, a cross-border bank is in distress. Now, sup a supranational setup with very strong powers is going to remove ring fencing, but in the end, ring fencing is affecting the capability of the cross-border bank to, to share risks between units. So affecting that uh, the, those uh, research impossibilities through the supervisory setup is going also to have an effect on the cross-border bank risk-taking. 
So our answer, so we, we, we ask ourselves what is the effect of different choices of supervisory setup on cross-border bank risk-taking, and our answer is that it depends, and we will emphasize different channels. And finally, all, all this, uh, to get to the, to the final and more important question, is when is the supranational authority beneficial from a welfare perspective? And our answer will be that not always, but yes, when there is large correlation, positive correlation across the, uh, across the assets of the cross-border bank, and this cross-border bank is also risky. So in a way, we will say maybe the Euro Area Banking Union is, uh, was the right response to, uh, through, the, through the centralization of, of decisions to address a ring fencing problem that would have been important in the case of the, of the Euro Area. But uh, then we have the flip side uh, of the answer is that since not always it's beneficial, in particular, there is no need to care about uh, ring fencing or supranational coordi coordination when there is negative correlation between the assets of the cross-border unit. And this is precisely the case when the cross-border bank is going to, to create more value. So in a way, is, this is a reassuring message that when cross-border banks create more value, then ring fencing is not a problem. So let me get to the model. There are, uh, there are uh, three dates, and there is universal <coughs> risk neutrality. This is a very stylized model. And there is a cross-border bank, and there are some authorities, supervisory resolution authorities. The cross-border bank has uh, two subsidiaries located in two countries, and each unit has a, a risky asset and, that, and some deposits that are uh, insured by a national uh, deposit insurance fund. And the structure of the bank is, is a pure bank holding structure. So there you have a, a pure bank holding company and two, two subsidiaries, and the, pure, uh, the bank holding company holds the equity of the group. Now, the assets of the, of the bank, they have some payoffs, an interim payoff that is freezeless at equal one, which is a small r, and a risky payoff at the final date, which is capital R in case of success and zero in case of failure. And now, the success pro probability as of t equal one <clears throat> can be high. In, in that case, we say the, the, the unit is healthy and, or can be low, in which case we say that the unit is uh, impaired. Now, as I said, correlation across the units is important. It is captured in the model by the correlation parameter rho, that it captures both the correlation at equal one and the correlation at equal two. And just uh, after some normalization uh, that uh, you have to bear in mind, rho equals zero means independence, rho positive is positive correlation, and as you get to one is maximum positive correlation, rho negative is negative correlation. So now uh, let's start with the interim date and let us uh, think about what national supervision is. So what, what, the way we model national supervision is where we say there is a one national authority that cares about each, each unit and that at the interim date can intervene in order to minimize the own deposit insurance costs. Now, the important, the interesting case is when the, the, that authority sees an impaired unit. And she can take uh, some sort of early intervention that we call liquidation, but it's not necessarily that. And it's an action that for the impaired unit is going, is going to reduce the deposit insurance costs. So these are the deposit insurance costs in case of, of early intervention on an impaired unit, and this would be the deposit insurance costs in case of no intervention, where you see the probability of default and the losses given default, because these losses are costs for the deposit insurance fund. Now, what we assume is that the early liquidation or early intervention reduces deposit insurance costs. So this authority would like to intervene. Intervention destroys some asset value. So this is something the, from a welfare uh, uh, perspective and also from the perspective of the bank, she, uh, the bank is not going to like. 
So what the bank can do is, in order to avoid the, the, the liquidation of the impaired unit, is to recapitalize it. And, uh, and there are two ways of recapitalizing the unit, either with some issuance of, um, of equity, external equity, that is costly, both privately and, and socially, or with, some, with what we call the internal capital market, from which is uh, uh, or support from the in case the other unit is healthy. Basically, the, the other unit can inject some some funds in uh, in the form of a, of an intra-group loan. Now, the the bank is going to prefer cross-unit support in order to save on the external cost of capital, but. That is the other authority, the authority that is responsible for the healthy unit that might not like that uh, transfer so, of resources from the healthy unit to the to the to the impaired unit. And in case in case she introduces some limits to 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 the support, we will refer to as a uh, refencing re action. So. In terms of modeling, how we are modeling the, the, this game between the bank and the two authorities, we, in, in the interesting case in which one unit, B, is impaired and the other is healthy, so the, the cross-border bank is going to propose a recapitalization plan that consists of how many units X of external capital are going to be raised and injected in the impaired unit. And uh, also the, the cross-unit uh, support, which is uh, a loan, a transfer small s of units from the healthy to the, to the impaired unit against of a junior promise, capital S, at the final date. Now, each authority says yes, I agree, going forward or not. And if there is unanimous uh, approval, the plan, the recapitalization plan is undertaken. Otherwise, there is the liquidation of the impaired unit. So now let, let us look at the approval decision given a recapitalization plan. So now the, the authority responsible for the impaired unit is going to say, okay, if the plan is not approved, I am going to, to liquidate. This will be my cost of liquidation. If the plan is approved, this will be the expected cost. There will be default today, but with some probability there will be default tomorrow. The injection of capital, both external and internal capital, is going to reduce those costs for the, 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 for the deposit issuance cost. So if the, if the injection of capital is sufficiently large, no matter whether external or internal, that authority will say, yes, I agree. Now let us look at the, at the other authority, the authority of the responsible for the healthy unit. And here and everywhere in the paper, what is blue, <laughs> in blue, uh, we, we, we highlight things that are good from the perspective of who is taking the decision, and in red, things that are not so liked. And what you see, again, that authority is going to look at the deposit insurance costs under no recapitalization and deposit insurance costs in its own country under recapitalization. And the, the authority responsible for the healthy unit dis, dislikes the injection of funds from the healthy to the to the to the um, to the impaired unit. This is because in case of default tomorrow of the healthy unit, which can happen, there will be less resources in order to repay deposits. So that's it. that is why this is in red. But the authority realizes that the support is not just a gift; is against a loan, and the loan, whose promise repayment is capital S, will be repaid in some contingencies. That, that is why it enters with the, with the blue. Now, correlation matters, and it enters with the red, because when correlation is high, it is going to be more likely that the two units fail or succeed at the same time. So from the perspective of the authority that cares from deposit insurance costs, the value of the, of the, of the intra-group loan is going to be very low because the intra-group loan with very high uh, uh, positive correlation, the intra-group loan will only be repaid upon success when the two, two, two units are, uh, are succeeding and then the value of the loan will be appropriated by the shareholders 
of the bank holding company, not in a way the, the deposit insurance fund, which is the creditor. So this gets us to the, our first result when we have national supervision, the outcome of this uh, resolution of an impaired unit when the other is healthy is low correlation. This means independence, some slightly positive correlation and very negative correlation. Low, cor low correlation, the recapitalization will be fully via cross unit support. High and positive correlation, there will be some ring fencing and some limit on how much support the healthy unit can give to the, uh, to the impaired unit, and the bank will be constrained to issue at the parent level or the holding company level some, some external capital. Let us now think of, of what the a, a, a strong uh, supranational authority that is responsible for the two units would do. Now, the mandate of this, of this supranational authority, we assume, is that of minimizing the overall deposit insurance costs. So it cares about the average uh, or the overall deposit insurance costs. It doesn't care about potential redistributions between the two deposit insurance uh, funds. So it is going, uh, the supranational authority is going to approve a recapitalization plan if, when added, adding up the two uh, the two authorization constraints we, we, we were seeing in the previous slide, on average or on aggregate, that constraint is satisfied. And let me highlight here, again, blue, good, red, bad. Let me highlight again uh, how sh this authority is, is seeing the support from the healthy to the import unit. So she realizes that support is good in terms of red reducing depo deposit insurance costs in the impaired unit. But she also realizes that it is bad in terms of increasing deposit insurance costs in the healthy, in the healthy unit. But the overall effect of this is not, is not a pure redistribution because the cross unit support reduces overall deposit insurance costs. And this is because in a way, funds are flowing from a part of the bank holding company that is sa safer to a part that is riskier. So those funds co will contribute to, to pay deposit, uh, deposits with higher likelihood when they are in the impaired unit. So in a way, by providing uh, voluntary support, the bank holding company is foregoing some of the limited liability pro protection that it has. The supranational authority is aware of this, and it is going always to, to, to when there is such authority, we will have that the outcome of the game is that the import unit is always fully recapitalized through cross unit support. There is never a ring fencing. But importantly, this is going to give rise to some redistribution across deposit insurance funds as, as a solution to the crisis. Now, for low correlation, national and supranational uh, uh, supervision is the same because there is no ring fencing, but for high and positive correlation, the outcomes are different. And, this, and the cross-border bank is going to get more value from the resolution of the impaired unit when there is supranational supervision. Why? Because there is no need to raise external capital. So this takes us, or takes me, to the, to the, to the second question, which is, okay, we've seen that the different supervisory uh, uh, setups are going to, to, to give rise to different ways of solving distress at the interim date, different resharing possibilities within the cross-border bank. What are the risk-taking effects? Of, of this. And in order to, to, to address this question, what we do is to endogenize the, the risk of, of, the, of the units. And we assume that the state of each unit at equal one depends on something endogenous, that is some, some costly effort that the manager of, this, of the cross-border bank exerts at, at equal zero in each of the units. And it depends also on some uh, exogenously on something that we call the, the strength of the fundamental riskiness of the bank. 
We focus on large correlation because it's when there is a discrepancy between the two supervisory setups. And basically, in this expression, what you have is what is the value that the bank holding company is, uh, is generating from the possibility of, of support? And it is, and, 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 and it is this. With some probability, there will be cross-unit support, and the cross-border bank will appropriate some some gains from the from being able to 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 provide support. And these gains will depend on whether there is a national uh, regime in which those gains will be lower because there is ring fencing, or a supranational in which those gains will be maximized because there is no uh, ring fencing. And what we find is that I, I know I'm running a bit out of, of time, but there is a buffer, a time buffer from the previous paper, <laughs> which uh, <laughs> I, 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 that I, I, should be usable because uh, we have stressed that buffers have to be usable when needed. And uh, no, just, <laughs> okay, so there are two effects. I, I won't spend too, too much time, but by removing uh, ring fencing through supranational supervision, the cross-border bank realizes that there are more support gains. And this has two countervailing effects. There is a, 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 a nice and we think novel effect that fosters, incentivizes effort, which is what we call the charter value effect. If I know I can give support to a distressed unit, I have more incentives to, to, to be in a position to provide support. This effect, in order for this effect to, to, to arise, it is necessary that the decisions are taken at the bank holding company level. It's a, someone that internalizes the, the value at the entire group of taking uh, good uh, actions uh, at the unit level. And then there is also a, a more standardly like, like free riding effect when you have some, the more resharing possibilities there are, the more incentives there are to, to exert, uh, to, to, to take risk. But, the, the, and the two are pushing in opposite directions. What we show is that depending on how risky for fundamental reasons the bank is, one is going to dominate or the other. And, and this, once we take into account what are the ex-ante risk-taking implications of, of the different supervisory uh, setups, we can address the last question, which is when is beneficial one, one, one setup or the other. And what we find is that for weak banks, these are like banks that are fundamentally risky, the charter value effect dominates. This is the effect that was when you introduce super, uh, supranational supervision is going to push towards uh, more effort, so less risk. And so there will be less risk with supranational supervision. So this is good ex ante. And also exposed, removing ring fencing is good. So ex ante good, exposed good. So we will have that welfare is going to increase and deposit insurance costs are going to, to get reduced when we introduce the supranational authority. Things could be different when the banks are very safe. So somewhat paradoxically, you like, uh, like very safe banks not to be supervised uh, centrally. But I mean, this is a very simple model, very stylized by my, my if we, we had to say where the Euro area banking union sits. Probably we are sitting here or we were sitting here over the past decade and so supranational supervision is something good. And then to, to, to conclude, just get, let's get, at, uh, get back to the, to, the, to the issue of the correlation. High and negative correlation that is not going to be risk fencing exposed. And uh, from an ex-ante perspective, there will be many situations in which an impaired unit could, will be able to be supported by by a healthy unit because of negative correlation. So in these cases, the cross-border bank creates a lot of value through, through, its, through that internal capital market and ring fencing does not arise. So national authorities, there is no need of coordination when, when uh, resharing within the group is more important. And, uh, and for the high uh, positive correlation, there is this tension. When, save, when ring fencing is exposed very severe, it, is from an, it will be from an ex-ante perspective 
kind of unlikely, okay? Because the, that is uh, for very high uh, correlation. So in a way, the gains from supranational supervision are are somewhat 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 limited because tensions exposed mean tension to, from an ex-ante perspective those tensions will not arise so from it's not so likely that they will arise and let me conclude uh, let me conclude yeah. just very simple framework of rest financial restructuring and restraint of cross-border banks in which we 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 endogenize cross unit support the possibility of reinfencing and restating how it depends on on different uh, supervisory arch architectures. Contribution to literature, which is contribution to the, 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 the paper, the most related to our paper is the paper by Martin Anke and Patrick Bolton on, on, the, on the resolution of global banks. We stress the important role of asset correlation in financial restructuring. Policy takeaways, the main and most important one, in the Euro Area Banking Union, supranational supervision is uh, goes in the right direction in the direction that the model predicts welfare will increase and uh, and uh, deposit insurance cost will decrease in other for other cross border banks that have operations uh, more global operations that, uh, so that uh, correlation could be lower or even negative maybe reinfencing is something we don't have to care so much about it. That's it. Thank you, Anatoly. You used uh, the, your liquidity buffer to the last drop. Uh, <laughs> so discussant in Washington, D.C. is uh, Angela Madaloni. Um, Angela, can you hear us and see us and speak? Ten minutes is your time budget. Okay, I made it. Sorry, Philip. <laughs> I couldn't unmute myself. Hello to everybody. It's very nice to see a lot of friendly face and I'm really sorry I cannot be there with you. Um, I hope you see the slides well and I hope you can hear me well. Okay? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, I mean, uh, of course, the usual disclaimer apply uh, because, I mean, we all work in, uh, in policy institution. Uh, since we don't have enough, a lot of time, let me start. Um, so what does this paper do? Um, well, they provide a framework uh, to analyze basically uh, different uh, supervisory uh, architecture. And uh, uh, it is important that this framework, uh, to emphasize that this framework compares national supervision and um, supranational supervision in a very focused dimension, which is when considering intervention in cross-border banks. I mean, as Anatoly very well explained, I mean, there, is, there are cross-border banks, there are subsidiaries into different countries. And the other main point, which I think, and it was also said by, by Anatoly, I mean, the main inspiration to this, uh, to this approach is to look at the issue of ring fencing of assets. Uh, and a lot of us that have been working in central banking for a, not, a long time know exactly what happened during the, the great financial crisis. I mean, there were a lot of instances and a lot of talks about the consequences of this refencing of assets uh, across um, subsidiary of the same group. Um, I mean, there are, I mean, the model is very complex. I think you have, you have seen it and there are a lot of implications. In terms of ring fencing, I think the important point, which was also emphasized, is that with supranational architecture of supervision, generally there is no ring fencing. And then there is, and here I use maybe a bit of a terminology that I see in the paper, there is this increase in the risk convergence of bank assets and an ambiguous impact on risk taking. I mean, Anatoly talked about this. I think it didn't stress so much the, uh, this uh, implication on the convergence in the, in the area that is supervised by the supranational authority. And there is this idea instead that the supranational architecture would induce this convergence of the default risk among cross-border banks. Okay. Um, 
why is this important? I mean, just want to mention it. I think this idea of ring fencing is, uh, is something, I mean, this was also mentioned also in, uh, in previous talk. I mean, there is this idea, even now in the, in, uh, in, uh, the Euro area, with a somewhat supranational architecture, which is the SSM, there is the idea that there are a lot of limitations to how much capital and liquidity can be transferred no, across a subsidiary. And indeed, I took this, <coughs> this chart from, <coughs> from, a, from a speech, a previous speech of, of uh, uh, Andrea a couple of years ago. And here, I mean, he really talks about non-transferable liquid assets, I mean, in, uh, in non-domestic subsidiaries in, uh, in, uh, in Europe as trap liquidity. And this is like, very important because this, there is this idea that this trap liquidity is somewhat inefficient in the system. <clears throat> okay. Um, so I'm having some issue. Okay. Uh, what are the key features of the model? And I hope you realize, as I said before, that the, uh, the model is very complex, but I'm going to talk and focus on two main points. One is the riskiness of the assets. So the riskiness of bank assets are the par was the parameter gamma in the model. And then there is the risk taking aspect, which of course in the model is linked <coughs> to the banker's efforts, which is induced by a certain uh, setup in the supervisory architecture. And then there is the correlation of assets payoff, and Anatoly talked a lot about this, which is generally exogenous in the model. Okay, nothing, I don't understand. I want to say that um, these models provide a framework to analyze the implication of different uh, supervisory architecture in a context, in a very specific context, which is a context of recapitalization and resolution. So resolution is not mentioned so much in the, in, the, in the paper, but at the end, I mean, if there is no recapitalization, banks are resolved. And this is why <coughs> all the <coughs> implications are actually linked to, of course, the existence of the um, national deposit insurance. However, I was thinking that, I mean, supranational supervision has a lot of other dimension. It is not only this dimension that uh, basically is important when there are decisions of recapitalization to be taken. And I think this model, and this is not a, a critique, it's just a, a, a fact that does not provide insight about the role of supranational supervision, especially uh, in, uh, in a in an, in, 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 as an institution to increase resilience ex ante. And this is then I went to <clears throat> why the SSM was established a bit uh, in the euro area. And just to be clear, I mean, the three reasons why it was established, I copied and pasted from the website of the SSM, is the objective of the SSM are ensure the safety and soundness of the European banking system, increase financial integration stability, and ensure consistent supervision. So you can see there is a lot of emphasis on the ex ante risk taking and resilience of ensuring the resilience of the financial, uh, the banking sector before. And this is something that, I mean, I think the way the setup of this model cannot really tell us much. Okay. This is important to uh, uh, take into account. Now, let me talk about the risk taking aspect. Now, uh, as Anatoly explained, of course, there is this sort of ambiguous effect of supranational supervision on uh, risk-taking aspect. Now, the point here is that on this, actually, this is an aspect on which we had a lot of empirical evidence right now. We had evidence in other uh, regions, like in particular uh, in the US, but more, more recently, we have had a lot of evidence for the euro area linked, of course, to the implementation of the SSM. So we know that when the, uh, the SSM was implemented, banks decreased their exposure, decreased their lending, decreased their asset side, their reliance on all safe funding, they increased the risk-weighted assets. And also, I mean, during the pre-SSM period, banks that were 
around the threshold of the assets to be um, supervised by the SSM or not, I mean, some of them decrease their assets in order not to be supervised by the SSM. So what I'm saying here is that there is actually quite evidence that banks perceive supranational supervision as tougher supervision, and therefore, somehow they are taking action in order to, um, I mean, uh, to, 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 to deal with this uh, new tougher supervisor. Um, I'm also mentioning here some new work in progress that I'm doing, which is related to the TRIM, which is the internal review of, uh, uh, sorry, the, the SSM review of the internal model that was done uh, a couple of years ago. And here again, the announcement of the review, I mean, we find that banks increase the risk weighting of the riskier exposure, lend to safer borrower, and recover more from defaulting entities. So overall, I think there is quite some evidence that supervisory, I mean, supranational architecture is linked to a general decrease in the risk of the asset, which of course is a bit uh, difficult to square with whatever you have in the paper. I mean, this is a point that I wanted to make. The second point that I wanted to make is uh, the implication on pay, payoff correlation, because as you said, I mean, this is a key parameter of the model the correlations of the payoff, and when the national supervisors, uh, sorry, national supervision and supranational supervision is more or less uh, efficient or, uh, or optimal is linked to the correlation of the assets. And, uh, uh, okay, here uh, you said it only uh, uh, at the end, but I think you mentioned these results, which in a way really struck me. Um, in general, if the correlation is high, I mean, this is the, my, my second point, these are the results, results from, the, from the paper. Supranational architecture maximizes aggregate welfare, okay? However, these welfare gains are hump-shaped in asset correlation, and they are limited. And Nanatoli mentioned this at the end of his presentation. And something that really struck me is that in the paper, uh, they write, the authors write, so avoiding green, green fencing does not per se justify supranational supervision. So the idea is if we just have in mind to avoid green fencing, maybe we should consider that there are limits to the uh, benefits arising from supranational supervision. Um, now, I've been, th I've been thinking what is affecting pace of, of correlation since correlation seems to be so important. Okay, what are the factors that are affecting the correlation of payoffs? And I've been thinking that definitely convergence of supervisory criteria, increase in integration of banking market, increase in possible MAE cross-border, of course, are all factors that are likely to affect the uh, correlation of payoffs of assets uh, of banks uh, in different areas. Um, now, let me skip here. Um, Europe banking markets remain very segmented. I mean, these are charts that I took from the uh, latest financial integration report. And there also, as was mentioned also before, I mean, there is this general call from policymakers to try to achieve and to increase uh, integration in banking market. Um, so there is a general call to remove barriers, legal and prudential that creates obstacles. To the, uh, to the freedom of uh, movement of capital and liquidity within banking group. And also there are general call to increase standardization and the consistent implementation of uh, regulatory standards. So I've been thinking that these calls are gonna have consequences on the correlation of payoff uh, of bank assets. And therefore, I mean, the way we, we can look at the, uh, at the uh, distinction between national supervision and supranational supervision in the context of the model is going to be uh, affected by what is really uh, going on, for example, in you. Okay, um, so I've discussed a bit basically these two aspects, which I think are uh, particularly important, the risk of the risk of the assets and the correlation of payoff. Now, let me conclude with a couple of points that I wanted to make, which are not directly related to the, to the paper, but I think they are related to the issue of national supervision and supranational supervision, which I think they're important. 
So the first one, which is that, um, as I said before, there are a lot of other dimensions to sovereign national supervision, which are not taken into account because the model looks at a very specific dimension. And one thing that I was thinking is actually important also in the current con uh, environment that we are now living through, I would say, is that supranational supervision may make it easier to assess the interaction spillover between regulatory policy and other macroeconomic policies. And this is not something that is just conceptual. This is something that, for example, it happened during the, um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Okay, that said, it was like crisis management mode, but, but I mean, but- Angela, we need slowly to conclude because there's yes, not a yes, 14 I'm, I'm concluding, I'm just have to point. So uh, we have taken unprecedented supervisory decision quickly in close coordination with monetary policy measures. That was said by Andrea uh, in, uh, in her previous speech. And this is, as I said, seems to me very relevant also in the current financial and economic environment. And the last point that I want to make, and in this I close the circle and I go back to the reinfencing. Of course, we think about reinfencing in the context of the model and in general, when we look at the bank, assets of banks and you know, transfer of liquidity, for example, from banks to a subsidiary of an, uh, another bank subsidiary in the same banking group. However, I think maybe we should start thinking more in the future <laughs> what we think about ring fencing of assets um, when we consider the possibility of transfer to other non-bank intermediary in the same group. Because there could be instances in which you know, it may be optimal from a financial stability point of view, the transfer of certain assets of liquidity to support other non-bank intermediaries, but may, this may, of course, be uh, not something that is not allowed by uh, supervisors in general. Okay, so very interesting paper, a lot of food for thought, and with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you. The floor is open again. David, please uh, use the previous practice to instead introduce yourself. Yes, uh, David Zrachowski from the European Central Bank. Thank you very much. Very interesting paper and the discussion. I have uh, one comment and a question. Uh, so the, the comment would be on the interpretation of the payoff rates and the co increased correlation. When you presented the paper, I was thinking that it might be during the systemic crisis that, uh, you know, payoff uh, rates tend to correlate more. And I think this is exactly the periods when um, ring fencing arrangements are more likely to appear, right? Uh, and, and now I, th I think about Vienna initiatives when you wanted to break break those uh, ring fencing arrangements. Uh, so, so that's I think a nice interpretation uh, to to this uh, uh, extended correlations during systemic crisis. Now the question is um, also Andrea showed that uh, Angela sorry showed that. One of the reasons to, to set up the, the SSM was, was uh, a possibility of, of further financial integration. But still, in spite of the common supervision framework, in spite of the common resolution framework and, and common deposit insurance framework, we have barely seen over the last couple of years cross-border mergers or acquisitions. So how does it square? Can you shed some light on this through the lenses of your model? And if not, maybe you can try to ask those questions uh, via your model. Thank you. Thank you. Diana, and then there was a third question in the back. So, and Anatoly, so you... Uh, so, so in the paper, you have uh, either a national uh, supervisory authority that minimizes the national cost of deposit insurance or a supranational one that minimizes the overall cost of deposit insurance. But in the euro area, we still do not have the complete banking union, right, with common deposit insurance. So what, what is the objective function of, of the supranational authority in that setting? I, I jumped a question from the right there, so maybe we go zigzag to the left afterwards. Yeah, Daniel Gro, European Central Bank. 
supervisory arm, so a very practical question. Uh, do you, linking to also to the previous paper on, on cyber risk, do you think incidents such as those that we have been uh, uh, seeing in the cyber risk paper, so sudden liquidity shock due to uh, infrastructure unavailability or uh, any other such shocks that we see now, uh, for example, the, in, in the Silicon Valley Bank, the Twitter bank runs, as they call them. So depositors withdrawing deposits much more quickly due to panic in, involving social media. Are those elements something that somehow uh, makes the discussion about the re removal of ring fencing a bit more relevant and a bit more uh, calling for action. Thanks a lot. That's the last question in the back there. Hi, Giovanni Bassani from DSSN. Um, you seem to pay a lot of um, attention. I mean, you, you know, to seem to pay. You pay surely a lot of attention to this change in supranational supervision. But uh, the issue here, I think, and unfortunately in parallel, uh, the regulation has not changed. So even uh, all this aspect about ring fencing uh, that, uh, again, in Andrea's speech has been uh, highlighted uh, several times are not due to the fact whether there is national or supranational supervision, but about the fact that we have a re regulatory system, which is pretty much nationally based. And that's why we don't basically have um, cross-border integration. Uh, there, there's been some benefits from supranational supervision, but without an attendant change in, in regulation, we have already an embedded ring fencing in the system for which supervision can do nothing. So, th thank you very much for, for the many questions. And uh, I will answer uh, selectively. So I will answer what I think is more important and I, I can give uh, an answer too. So uh, in the model, the supranational authority has a lot of powers and has all the powers or many of the powers under Andrea complains about the SSM or the Euro Area Banking Union framework not having. The supranational authority, in a way, can induce redistribution of costs between national uh, deposit insurance funds. This is something I think the single resolution board or cooperating with, this, uh, with the SSM in, in solving a cross-border bank will have problems with. Because of the reasons you were saying in, the, in the, the current Euro Area Banking Union is as opposed to that very stylized uh, setup in the model is incomplete. So the supranational authority in the model is what the Euro Area Banking Union may achieve at some point when the three pillars are completed. And um, mm, so this, when it comes to, to the deposit insurance or the lack of completion of the, of the banking union. And uh, then when it comes to some people that were saying, we don't see that cross-border integration. So maybe the, pro the, 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 the model would tell you because uh, that potential value that cross-border banks would create if the supranational setup the, 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 the uh, institutional setup were truly supranational with all the three pillars completed are not still there. So many of the, the, the banks uh, anticipate that there will be frictions that in the end we are still in a some, some, uh, somehow national setup and may, part of the, of the potential uh, gains from cross-border banking cannot be materialized because among other things, uh, um, ring fencing. Then when it comes to some of the comments by Angela, and uh, mm, I think something that is interesting and it, it is, uh, and you need a, a model, and you need a model. You were seeing, you were saying the, 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 the SSM was going to be, was created to be tough and being tough with banks is something good. Our model says something different. Our model says the SSM will, will be 
more lenient with banks when it comes to providing voluntary support with, uh, across units. And being lenient, more lenient than, than a national setup, banks anticipate that allows them to preserve value and then they, they might be willing for this, this charter value uh, effect, they might be willing when fencing with this more lenient uh, supervisory authority in this particular aspect, to, they might be willing to uh, take less risk, nor, not more risk. And, uh, and then regarding the, the, the mandate of the, of, the, of, how, of the way we are modeling our, uh, the mandate of our authorities is minimizing expo expected deposit insurance costs. So in a way, these authorities dislike financial instability, dislike uh, bank risk, because when there are bank problems, the, this ter turns out showing up as uh, costs for the deposit insurance. So in a way, I think we are capturing some, in, 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 in a stylized manner, a very concrete and focused manner, some of the part of the mandate of the SSM. Thank you very much. Obviously, um, the big elephant in the room is uh, the fiscal arrangement in the in the union. So, maybe I wonder whether there is another game going on that deserves its own model, where that is actually fully taken into account, where there are spreads that can go up and down and so on, and change the fiscal position or their starting positions are different. So, so but I'm looking forward to the next step of this research, where that that pattern, um, which we all learned over the years, is so important, um, is also is also addressed.